Hello everybody and welcome back to our lecture series. I am Ted, your host, and for this lecture we are going to uh, continue our examination upon the, uh, the the troubles of the Western Roman Empire. Uh, in our last lecture we looked at some of the alternative dates for the, uh, the fall, the collapse of the Western Roman Empire. Um, and we ended our, 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 our last lecture looking at the, uh, the sack of Rome carried out by Alaric and the Visigoths. It was the first time that a foreigner had attacked and taken the city of Rome since Brennus and the, and, uh, the Celts had done it um, some 800 years uh, prior. It, was a, uh, it wasn't so much of a political or even a, uh, an economic downturn for, for Rome. Um, the Rome had long since uh, fallen from being the uh, political or cultural, even social capital of either half of the Roman empires. In the east, Constantinople was the great imperial center, and in the west, Ravenna was the great imperial center. Now, um, now uh, let, let's join in and sort of pick up um our, our narrative and, and our narrative uh picks up with the with the huns the huns had been watching what was happening in rome they they knew they could beat the germans the, they weren't afraid of the germans the germans were afraid of them and they they had seen that the sack of rome by a german by a german war band was a great psychological boon for the germans and the huns they took notes and they began to make moves of their own now, the Huns eventually marched on the Romans uh, for the first time in the east. Uh, they plagued the eastern provinces with raids that only ended when the eastern emperor paid tribute uh, to them, uh, to the war band. But then they turned their, uh, but then they, um, but then they turned their attention to the, to the, uh, to the western empire. And under their most famous king, Attila, um, their, their westward movement would bring together the Romans, the Visigoths, the remaining Celts, um, the Franks, and the Burgundians. All these peoples uh, who were motivated by a mutual fear of the Huns. Um, these actions, these events, they all came together, they culminated in 451, uh, in, in which all those sides fought the very bitter battle of Chalons. Um, and the battle was basically a draw, and it led to the eventual withdrawal of the Hunnic army. Now, this battle was a success for both sides. Attila had sized up his opponents, and the Western Empire, along with the Germans and the Celts, they got a much-needed breather from the Huns. Now, the next year, Attila had planned to pick right up where he last left off. He once again invaded Italy, and he started heading directly towards Rome. Uh, now, unlike Hannibal, Attila had uh, siege engineers. He had subordinates who were very knowledgeable in siege warfare. And in an interesting episode, the Bishop of Rome, and at this point there is a Bishop of Rome uh, or a Pope, um, Leo I, he went north to meet Attila to persuade Attila to not attack the city. Um, no, nobody was under any illusion that the Huns would be easily bought off uh, and, and not attack Rome or lightly sack Rome the way that the, the Visigoths had been, uh, had been bribed and bought off to do so. Uh, so the two had lunch, uh, the Pope and the, the Hunnic king. And after this lunch, Attila withdrew from Italy. Now, nobody knows what was discussed between the two. Nobody knows what Leo I said to Attila or why Attila decided to withdraw from Italy. Some say that Leo I gave Attila a very large bribe. Others say that disease crept into the Hunnic army. And there's, there's even this tradition, this tale, um, mainly, mainly promoted by early Christians, that said that Leo, upon meeting Attila, pointed to the sky where Saints Peter and Saints Paul stood over Attila in the sky with flaming swords. Uh, whatever the case, Attila left. He left uh, Italy. He returned to his domains. On the way, he stopped off, picked up a young German girl, uh, and took her home. Uh, uh, he married the, the girl, and at the marriage ceremony, 
he uncharacteristically drank too much. He ate too much, and he died in his bed. Um, Europe was saved um, because without the leadership of, of, of Attila, the, the Huns had a, had a unified force began to splinter. His sons fought uh, among each other for primacy, and the Huns, uh, they, they would remain on the scene, but they would never be half formidable fighters or had a formidable of force had they had been before. They were never again really a serious threat to the Western Empire or to the Germans. Now, the Western provinces uh, of, of the Roman Empire, they were still in danger, however. The Vandals, um, uh, who had led uh, the invasion of Italy, um, uh, who, who had led uh, the invasion of, of uh, Hispania and settled in North Africa, they invaded Italy. They, they, they came back, they invaded Italy in 455 and they sacked Rome. And this sack was destructive. Rome was thoroughly looted. Uh, the city would not recover from this sack. Uh, the Western Empire limped along um, and in 455, uh, and, and 455 is really suggested had the date for the fall of the Roman Empire with this very destructive, very chaotic sack carried out by the Vandals. Um, and the Vandals thereafter are remembered um, as uh, had thieves. You know, you think of the word Vandal, you don't think of a uh, German ethnic tribe or, or ethnic group. You think of, you know, someone who destroys property or takes property. Vandals vandalize. That that's how they are. Uh, that's how they remember because of this sack on Rome. Uh, the Western Empire limps along. Um, it, it, the empire, the Western Empire, does not come to a halt. Uh, it does not stop naming emperors until the year 476, when the last emperor of the West, a man uh, with the unfortunate name of Romulus Augustulus, uh, is forced to retire by an invading German king. Romulus Augustulus, um, he had the, uh, the dubious distinction of being the last Roman emperor in the West. And the date of his removal is commonly cited at the end of the Roman Empire as a whole and at the end of the Western Empire. Now, the Western Empire definitively ends uh, and, and the Germans begin to then carve up uh, the former provinces into, uh, into kingdoms of their own. Now, in the East... The Eastern Empire proved to be surprisingly resilient, and they continued to name Roman emperors in an unbroken line until 453. 453 is the date that the Ottoman Turks, having gained access to cannons and gunpowder, break the walls of Constantinople, and they take the city after many failed attempts. So the Eastern Empire fall, uh, fall date of... 1453 is also argued has a possible date for the fall of the Roman Empire. Now, why the empire fell also has many possible answers. Uh, poor leadership, um, being critically under uh, undermanned, those are cited as reasons. Christianity, Christianity is cited as a reason for fatally weakening Roman values. Um, the, the barbarian invasion, the frequent attacks by the Germans, are cited as reason for the fall of Rome. Um, economic factors are also argued, are, are are also argued for the decline of the Roman Empire. Um, the Romans, had they began to parcel out land to the Germans in exchange for military service, they lose ar arable land. They 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 lose arable land. Uh, the number of available workers is reduced. Um, the income from taxes is reduced because they don't have people working that they can tax and they don't have the land that they can tax. The alienation of land, um, and this is the land that was given to the, the barbarians, uh, created an unbearable economic strain. Um, climate change um, that, that resulted in lower crop yields has also been argued. Um, others argue that the inequality of the empire led to its decline. Economic stagnation due to an over-reliance on slave labor. Uh, conversely, others argue that there was a shortage of slaves to provide labor. And, and that led to the decline of the Roman Empire. Now, uh, another argument, um, and, and this one is really more 
of a, of a social commentary than a real argument for the decline of the Roman Empire was moral degeneracy. Um, that, that the Roman Empire morals had left to such a point that, that they were not worthy of uh, maintaining their empire. Um, that, that's an argument made by, by, by scholars. Now the questions, uh, the, these answers, uh, the, the questions, they, they, their answers depend on a number of aspects, namely the aspects of history that you favor. Um, the decline of the Roman Empire fascinates scholars and lay people because it is the collapse of a once powerful civilization that results in a quote-unquote millennia-long dark age. The assumption that uh, has been that uh, the the assumption has been that Europe um, and thus the world, um, and and that's a that's along with the Eurocentric line of thought that that Europe descended into a uh, a thousand years of, of ignorance um, with the collapse of the Roman Empire uh, of the Western provinces, I should say, of the Roman Empire. Now that assumption has been challenged uh, and challenged vigorously. In the in the preceding years, um, and and in preceding lectures on uh, um, in the uh, in the following lectures on Europe, I will also challenge that that perception of a dark age in Europe. Uh, in the in the in the uh, in the following lectures, we will um, we, we we will look at the cultural exchange that takes place um, between the Germanic tribes and and the Romans. Uh, and Roman culture, really, that is, that is left. Uh, and we will examine this new culture that will arise. We will also look at the formation of states in the wake of the, of the collapse of the Roman Empire in the West. And I will also acknowledge that the Germanic migrations, they, they weren't migrations at all. They were really invasions. Um, what, what happened was that you had these invasions from these various Germanic groups that overwhelmed uh, the existing Roman uh, imperial structure, and that these invasions were accompanied with a very, uh, with a very great deal of violence and destruction. Okay. Now, uh, before we get to um, looking at, uh, before we get to discussing and looking at the uh, society that emerged after the Roman Empire fell, uh, I, I would like to just continue on with Rome and look at the legacy of Rome and look at how the Romans moved on after the retirement of Romulus Augustulus. Because again, there was still a Roman emperor there in the city of Constantine, in Constantinople, there was a Roman emperor on his seat who, when Romulus Augustus was retired, his imperial regalia was sent to the, uh, to the emperor in the east. It, it wasn't really clear that the, the Romans had lost possession of those western provinces. It was only clear that there was only one Roman emperor from now on. Um, um, the, uh, the eastern portion, the eastern provinces, the eastern, the eastern empire continued to flourish long after Rome fell from being an imperial center. Uh, long after the uh, the Western provinces fell and were absorbed by the nascent Germanic tribes, uh, by by the states of the nascent Germanic tribes, uh, they were viewed the the Eastern emperors and Eastern provinces. They were viewed as Romans. They were they were viewed by that by their contemporaries and by themselves. Uh, later historians labeled them and their empire the Byzantine Empire and this was done to reflect the old Greek colony of Byzantium which was located on the site of what which, which is located I should say on the site of the city of Constantinople so before we begin our lecture um, our, our discussion on the Eastern Empire and the uh, the fate and the legacy of, of Rome uh, in the East I would like to discuss the, the city of Constantinople, uh, the modern day city of Istanbul, which uh, sits on the traditional border between Europe and Asia. Um, it's it's uh, not at the center of Eurasia, but just at the border of what, of what uh, modern historians, modern groups are uh, labeled the borders of Europe and Asia. 
and, and the city is on a horn-shaped peninsula that juts out into the Bosporus, and Constantinople sits at and controls a vital economic crossroads. All of the main trade routes that link the Near East uh, along with uh, Western Europe uh, and, uh, and Northern Europe, they, they, they all converge at that point. Um, the lucrative shipping carrying goods to and from the Black Sea, they all had to pass through the Bosporus Straits. Um, most of the ships carrying, uh, carrying goods from the Mediterranean, they also sailed past the city. Now, Constantinople was a key border zone as well as uh, had the place where all of the cultures that we discussed met and mingled. It was a it was Babylon on the, on the Bosporus, basically. Um, these factors gave Constantinople a uniquely cosmopolitan and worldly character. Most importantly, uh, the the Eastern emperors. Um, for the Eastern Emperor, the, the city was located on a wonderfully defendable site. Uh, the city is on high ground with water surrounding three sides. Uh, the Golden Horn, uh, the Sea of Marmara, and of course the Bosper Straits. The Constantinople could only be approached by land uh, uh, from a hostile source on its western side. The Eastern Emperors uh, they, they constructed some of the most impressive and varied um, fortifications of the ancient world to defend Constantinople. The city was capable of defending itself against larger forces, uh, e even larger waves of attackers. The city was also noted for its enchanting beauty. When Constantine established Constantinople as the capital of the, uh, of the Eastern Empire, he made an enormous effort to equip it with amenities and structures and buildings that were found in Rome. Uh, we already discussed the fact that it had a grain dole, that it had a senate house, that it had a palace, uh, and, and huge public entertainment uh, complexes, namely the Hippodrome. He also um, had Constantinople divided into 14 districts. Um, uh, and these districts were for local administrative purposes. Now, the most splendid of all of the public entertainment buildings really was the Hippodrome, um, the, the place where chariot races were held uh, in a Roman city. Now, the Hippodrome of Constantinople was decorated with several attractions. There were uh, bronze columns of intertwining serpents, and that was taken from Delphi. There was an Egyptian obelisk that was taken from Karnak Temple. Uh, another another great monument uh, in the Hippodrome were four great bronze horses. Now those those four great horses were later taken by the Venetians and put up on the Cathedral of San Marco, uh, where they remain to this day. Now other monuments that were that that are I should say now lost include a um, a, a, a she wolf. Um, nursing uh, the infant Romulus and Remus, and this is uh, an important moment in the myth of the founding of the city of Rome. Uh, there's also a, a, a statue, uh, there, there was, I should say, also a statue of a donkey and its keeper, which relates to a story from the Battle of Actium. Caesar Augustus was walking around on the eve of the battle, and he met a man pulling his donkey. Curious, he asked the man what his name was, and the traveler re responded that his name was uh, uh, Eutyches and his donkey's name was Nikon. Uh, now, the names are very important, uh, and those are Greek names. Um, they mean prosperity and victory. Uh, the walls, uh, and, and of course, they, the, the names are a nod to... Caesar Augustus' later prosperous reign, and of course his victory at the Battle of Actium. Now the walls that protected Constantinople, uh, they were torn down and rebuilt by a succession of emperors. But by the 6th century, the walls were 35 feet high, 75 feet thick. There were 96 great towers uh, facing along, facing along the, uh, the, the, the imperial walls. 
there was a protective ditch that greeted attackers and uh, the walls of Constantinople were actually a, a set of two walls nested within another one. So even if the first wall, which was lower than the second wall, fell, the defenders could retreat and shoot down on their attackers. Now, one architectural feature that differentiated Rome and Constantinople was the water supply. Uh, Rome was fed water from aqueducts, a, a series of aqueducts that brought in uh, water from the mountains. Um, Constantinople was built with the fence in mind and boasted an impressive series of internal water supply mechanisms. What Constantine constructed, what, what he constructed was a series of underground cistern um, uh, and one cistern, one of these uh, cisterns was capable of holding some 66 million cubic gallons of water. Uh, Justinian added a cistern that was capable of holding 20 million cubic gallons of water and just this, uh, Justinian's cistern uh, still exists underneath the city, uh, the modern day city, and it still serves as a water reservoir for the city. Now, of the 96 emperors who ruled over Constantinople, none was more famous uh, than, than, than Justinian. He, he still stands out largely among all Roman emperors, had the, one of the very best, um, definitely the greatest since uh, Trajan. Um, nobody really comes close to Justinian and his, uh, his, his, the, the accomplishments of his reign. Now, Justinian's career begins when he is just a young boy. Uh, he's sent to live with his uncle Justin. Uh, and Justin was uh, the emperor, he was the emperor in the east. Um, Justin took Justinian on as an assistant. And through his merits, Justinian becomes Justin's main confidant. Uh, when Justin began to lose his ability to reign, Justinian took, so, uh, take, took over. He took over the administration of the empire, and when Justin died, he succeeds his uncle in 527. As emperor, Justinian embarks upon an energetic program of constructing new buildings, repairing old buildings, uh, re reforming society, and uh, and 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 uh, sweeping reorganization of the Eastern Empire, of, of, of its bureaucracy, in addition to some very important conquests. Now, despite his imperial ties, Justinian remains something of an outsider within the uh, elite of the imperial court. Now, Justinian also had the habit of uh, uh, what um, his detractors would, would call the bad habit of appointing people to important posts and, uh, and positions based on their abilities rather than their pedigree. Um, now, now this allowed him to draw upon a very talented core of administrators who he was uh, who, who he was able to rely on, but it also put him at odds with the elite of Constantinople who were angered at being passed over for high office by those who they would deem their social inferiors. Now, Justinian also caused quite a stir in his selection of a consort. He married a woman named Theodora. Uh, now, Theodora was several decades younger than Justinian, and she was from the, the lower classes. Um, there are a number of rumors that still persist about her, namely uh, those regarding her low pedigree. Uh, and they they range from things from uh and well well a number of uh, of true stories also persist about her but 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 the uh, but the attacks on Theodora mainly concern her her low pedigree her her um her her humble origins uh, her father was rumored to have been a bear wrangler for the hippodrome um she was rumored to be a, a prostitute. Um, well, we do know that she worked in the sex industry and that she performed a very risque routine. Um, don't know if she actually traded sex for money, but that's that's a rumor and an allegation that, that was made against her then and people still hold it now. 
the uh, the veracity of much that was recorded about her is very is, is questionable. Uh, much of what we know about her comes from sources very hostile to her. She was an intelligent woman, a strong-willed woman, and she took an active role in governing the empire. Uh, sources tell us that she was a key advisor to, to uh, Justinian, that she played a, a, a public role almost from day one. Um, she uh, almost from day one, she took a uh, very public role and she was very active in policy making. Uh, she was a very forceful advocate for, women, for what we will call women's rights. Um, Theodora championed law that gave women better protection from abuse, um, more rights as, uh, as citizens. And, and she also took uh, the position of, of advocating for the board's women's rights as well. Now, all of her advocacy made her a target for resentment and criticism. And in 532, Justinian faced a crisis which nearly ended his reign. The two most popular teams in the Hippodrome were the Greens and the Blues. And these two teams had always had a rivalry that sometimes resulted in violence and riots. Now, around this time, both teams, both teams, both the Greens and the Blues, they became associated with rival sects of Christianity. And, uh, and, uh, and, 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 uh, around this time, um, and around this time, uh, there was a, um, a, a criminal proceeding going on in which Justinian refused to pardon, um, two criminals. And, and, and just, it just so happened that one criminal was from each, uh, of, of the teams. Angered that Justinian refused to pardon the criminals, uh, the, the supporters of the teams and the two teams themselves, they joined together and they rioted throughout Constantinople. Uh, the riots were so out of control that the teams then tried to replace Justinian with another emperor. Um, these riots are known as the Nika riots and they lasted a week. Much of the city of the uh, of the ancient city of the old city of Constantinople was destroyed during the riots. There is a story uh, that right as things looked their bleakest, Justinian began to prepare to evacuate the city and give up his career as emperor. But then Theodora rallied his spirits and convinced him to stick it out. Um, Justinian then calls in the army, who suppressed the rioters and restored order, killing some thirty thousand people in the process. Now, Justinian will go on from the Nika riots to a nearly very uh, successful career um, reconstituting the Roman Empire. Now, Justinian did this by conquering the Germanic kingdoms that had carved out portions of the Western, uh, portion of the, uh, the Western Imperial provinces. The architect of these military victories was a general named Belisarius. Now, Belisarius led many of the campaigns uh, of, of, of Justinian forces in the western and central uh, Mediterranean. Belisarius' first campaign, um, during his first campaign, I should say, he managed to capture North Africa from the Vandals and then to use that as the base of operation to invade and capture Sicily before heading to the mainland, uh, the Italian mainland, where he where he recaptured the city of Rome and took, took, took possession of most of the Italian peninsula. What, what Belisarius did was nothing short of remarkable. Uh, in one fell swoop, uh, well, not in one fell swoop, but in a couple of uh, swoops of the sword, they had managed to reconstitute about half of the Western Empire. They brought back in North Africa and they took possession of Italy. Uh, a remarkable achievement for anybody. Now, the, um, the, the other uh, Eastern, Roman, uh, Eastern Roman generals managed to capture parts of Spain and for a brief moment, Justinian's Roman Empire approached the sides of the old empire. Um, the military campaigns, however, cost a lot of money. And financing these military campaigns depleted Justinian's resources, which were further dissipated by conflicts with the Sasanian Persians. 
Now, the Sasanians were a very powerful and expansionist empire in their own right. Um, and they were a much greater threat to Justinian than, uh, than, the, uh, than the nascent German kingdoms in the, in the western provinces, in the, west of, uh, the, the, the western shadow um, of his empire. Now, for Justinian, um, it was of greater importance uh, to protect the, the wealthier cities of the Eastern Mediterranean. Justinian conquests, while impressive, um, were, were really unattainable, uh, un, un, uh, un, un, uh, un, unkeepable after his death. Uh, the Roman Emperor for forced to give up their holdings in the central and western Mediterranean um, to these various Germanic kingdoms. From 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 that point on, from 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 uh, from that point on, the western Mediterranean uh, would be would be Germanic, and the Roman Empire would be exclusively the eastern provinces. Though the emperors did maintain a close hold on the Bishop of Rome for a while forcing bishop elects to ask for imperial permission before taking their their uh, e e e e uh, episcopal seat sorry about that um, now the empire provinces will become uh, will, will, will come under uh, increasingly attacks uh, and the extent of the emperor's powers would be in continual decline now at Constantinople after the Nika riots, Justinian embarked on a huge building campaign, and he had to do so because most of the city was destroyed by the Nika riots. Um, among the, the buildings that, that he had commissioned was one of the most impressive of all of history, and this, of course, would be the Hagia Sophia, or the Church of Holy Wisdom. Um, this church uh, was began in... Um, 537. 537 was when the uh, was when they began construction on the church. Um, Justinian chose two very famous uh, uh, men to to work on the church. He chose a, a very famous scientist and a mathematician, uh, Isidore of Miletus and Antimius of Tralis. Um, and they were both to serve as the architects for, for the Hagia Sophia. Now, the, the building, the building it itself was centered on a suspended zone, uh, dome, which was, um, set up on a, uh, on a sort of boxy like structure. Now, the space beneath the dome was some 100 feet across and some 170 feet high. Now, the center of the Hagia Sophia held a mosaic portrait of Christ the All-Powerful in bright colors on a shining gold background. Uh, the columns and the walls that, that, uh, that, that were in the Hagia Sophia were all made of the finest decorative... Uh, I'm sorry, it's, uh, it's been a long afternoon. Uh, um, the, the columns of the of the Hagia Sophia were were all made of the finest decorative marble uh, and they were decorated in these very vivid shades of black um, purple red yellow and green the very 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 vivid uh, vivid uh, shades of those colors um, the great dome collapsed actually after 20 years and it had to be rebuilt but it still stands today the Hagia Sophia is domed it still stands today. In antiquity, it was an astonishing structure, uh, and it remains to this day. Um, when Constantinople was captured by the Ottoman Turks, uh, they, they, they converted the Hagia Sophia into a mosque. So now the site is home to spiral minarets, um, and the site really now is a museum. Um, the, the Turkish government had turned the Hagia Sophia into a museum. Now, at Justinian's command, another great work was commissioned, and this was uh, and, and and this would have long-term effects on the surrounding areas. 
um, this commission was the compilation, the, the compilation of, of all existing Roman laws. Uh, the finished product will be known as the Code Justinian and was a definitive edition of the past accumulation of Roman, Roman legal precedents. The code consisted of legal statutes uh, and an analysis by eminent legal jurists um, during Justinian's reign. The compilation of Roman law survives uh, so that it became the direct source for much of the world's current legal systems and the indirect source for the other, for the other legal systems. The law code was influential because it was used as an early uh, it was used at an early law school, and this would be the law school founded at Bologna during the Middle Ages. The Code of Roman Law was used to create all the law codes in Europe. Justinian's code influenced the uh, a, a influence was expanded during the uh, the age of colonialism um, to the rest of the world, all all of the other countries. Um, uh, all of the other countries that seem to be as separate and distinct as the Bahamas, India, and Bulgaria, they all use a legal system that, uh, that is either directly or indirectly inspired by or, or influenced by Roman laws. Um, England deviated by developing English common law. Uh, but much of English common law structure and terminology was derived from the Code of Justinian. Now, the Code of Justinian serves as the, the prime example of the of the uh, the most far-reaching impact that Rome and Roman civil civilization has had on the modern world. Uh, and with that, we'll break, and when we come back, we'll look at. Um, at the world had they continued to unfold uh, in the wake of the collapse of the Roman Empire in the West. Um, as always, hit like, subscribe, and comment. Let me know what you thought about this lecture. Uh, it's always interesting uh, for well, whenever I have to explain um, Justinian's code and the importance of Justinian's code.